And it's so good that we are in John, because as we know, we said before that John is the disciple, the beloved of Christ. He's a disciple that says, he's, he's, he's given himself the title, the disciple that Jesus loved, which is a bit presumptuous, but Jesus loved all his disciples, but John was really close to Jesus. You know, we've got lots of friends, we've got friends, but we've got a few very close ones who are very close to our hearts. And this is how it was with Jesus and John. Mm. So this is why John is able to, when I um, go through John, it's a small book. It's one, two, and three, but it's so full of so much. I find it quite hard to get through because it's like every other sentence, there's a really great deep morsel in it that you can um, find the love of God and who Jesus is and what he want, how he wants us to be. So I've, I've found it quite hard to get through this quickly or to shorten shorten it to fit into like half hour. That's probably, that's why the first one I did in two bits because there's so much in it. Anyway, what we'll do, we'll go straight to it. So um, it's 1 John 3. Um, this letter continues in the same theme of sin and being one of God's children. It's just the same theme all the way through. And John points out that these two things are not compatible. A, ch a child of God and sinning, they're not compatible. But by the end of the um, book, so by the end of the letters, um, John actually, it might be a bit confusing in the middle, but by the end of it, John actually tells you how you can live without sin. And as we said before, in the first, in the second, uh, 1 John 2, or is it 1? In 1 John 2, it says we've got an advocate with a father. So that if we sin, we've got someone to speak on our behalf. Mm. So this is what you must bear in mind, because this 1 John 3 is quite deep, and it talks a lot about sin, but it's not to condemn anyone. So let's jump into it. Okay, I'm going to read it, and then I'll go back um, verse by verse. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us, because it does not know him. Be beloved, now we are children of God, and it was not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And anyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, just as he is pure. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor know, known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he may destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. In this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. For this is a message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the wicked one, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. Mm. He does not love his brother, sorry, he who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. But this is, but by this we know love, because he's laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives to the brethren. But whoever has this world's good and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My children, let us not love in the word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts and know all things. Beloved, if our hearts does not condemn us, we have confidence towards God. And whatever we ask, we, should, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do these things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandments. 
Simon. Okay. Right, oh, that, that's quite, that's really heavy. Mm. That's very deep and we're going to dig into it now. Mm. And it's taken me five pages. We'll see how much we can get through. Amen. Right. This oh, letter, really? can, oh no, I've done that already. Um, where he says, behold, the man, the manner of love the Father has bestowed. That's a, that word bestowed, it means that it's something given and not heard. We don't have to earn Father's love. He gives it to us freely. He says, freely I give it, freely you receive it. That's what bestowed means. So it's quite a powerful word. I've given you this. I don't need nothing for you. You don't have to prove anything. Mm. It's a gift I've given to you. Oh, I've got to take my jacket off. Sorry. It's been hot already. <laughs> give me.
one comes to faith by faith to, to Jesus. So as soon as you come to faith with Jesus, he takes away the penalty of sin. Yes. Jesus takes away our sin in the sense of taking away the power of sin. This is an ongoing work in our lives for those who walk after Jesus. So it's, it's something that goes on all the time. It's taking away the power of sin that accuses us all the time. Mm. If we turn away from it, he, he will take it away. So it's, that's an ongoing work. It's forever until we, until we get to heaven. Mm. Jesus takes away our sin in the sense of taking the presence of sin away. This is a work that will be completed when we pass into eternity and are glorified in Jesus. So the only time we won't add any sin is when we are in the presence of God in heaven. So when, when John says, um, do not sin, it means a habitual sin. It means a sin, it's a sin that you kind of know you're doing, but you, you've come to terms with it. You've thought to yourself, oh, it's okay with God. It's okay. I can, I can do this and get away with it. That's what they call habitual sin. It's not the sin when a person just occasionally sins. It's not the same thing. John warns a believer in verse 7. Look at verse 7. He says, little children. See, he's calling us, he's calling us little children because at this stage, he believes that we, we need to be taught like little children. We need to be taught about this, this particular subject. Little children, let no one deceive you. You who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For the purpose the Son of God was made manifest. So he's, um, John is saying, he's describing um, those who sin habitually. He's not saying occasional sin. John wants a believer to let no one deceive them because there were many false teachers that distorted the gospel around that time. Just as it is now, it's no different. There's many false doctrines and many false teachers now. If we are made righteous through our faith in Jesus Christ, it will be seen in our righteous living. So if we do say we're Christians and we want to be like Jesus, it will be seen in the way we live our life. I mean, as I said, it won't be perfect, but we will see that people are trying to live a righteous life. Mm -hmm. The most important thing a believer can be is in right standing with God. We have every resource we need to live a righteous life. We have everything we need. We have the Word, we have the Spirit, and we have the knowledge of Jesus. We have everything we need. And we have a conscience. We also have a conscience before God. As a believer, we know, even when we were believers, we know when we were doing wrong things. We knew we, could, we, didn't, we mustn't steal. We knew we mustn't um, swear. Even as children, we know we mustn't swear, but nowadays, it's like a double language. It's, like a, it's just like, it's just part of the language. People don't even see that sin anymore, which is really sad. But, but we know, we know, we have a conscience. Amen. We cannot say, we cannot say that be at peace with sin in our life and make excuses like everyone sins in their life. Everyone has sin. People say everyone has sins in their life. This is my area of sin. Jesus understands. Jesus understands that he can deliver you from that. It's just we, we make this excuse. This type of excuse goes against everything we are in Jesus Christ and what he has done in our life. So that's, that excuse just doesn't watch with Jesus or with God for that matter. Um, I have a question. Now, we're not going to have too many questions today. I have a question. <laughs> I don't know who's going to ask. What excuses have you heard people say to excuse sin? It doesn't have to be what you say. You can say that I used to say this or I say this. But what excuses have you heard others say? Anyone? Sometimes they say that it's devil. Yeah? A lot of times people say, oh, the devil made me do it. Oh, which is a, quite a lame excuse. We have our own self-will. The devil can influence us, but we can actually say, no, yeah. we're not going to do that. We have our own self-will. So that excuse is, is not right. The devil made me do it. He does influence sin. I'm not, I'm not saying that. He influences our minds, for sure. And he influences even circumstances around us. He influences. Yeah. So I, but the devil can't make you do anything. Mm, you have the strength to be strong. Yeah, it says that the scripture resists the devil and will flee from you. As soon as you resist him, you've got to run away. Yeah. You can't be there saying, no, I'm not going. You, you better do this sin or else. No, he's got to run away because you've resisted him. Usually with the word of God. No saying, no, I'm not going to do this. He said in the word, God took away all my sins and I don't have to do this. 
Nobody's perfect. Yeah. Because there was um, a time um pastor was praying for one woman. Yeah. This woman is when you look at her, she looks genuine Christian, pure Christian. She sings. She's a rose Oh. Yeah. Okay. So when she came to our house for personal prayer, so when Pastor was praying for this woman, and the Spirit of God told Pastor, stop. That you should stop that prayer. And the members will go into prayer and say, God, why, why should I stop praying for the sister? He said, because she's a heterosexual. 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 No, heterosexual. You know. No, no. Check it in there. Check it in there. Heterosexual. Heterosexual. Yeah. No, no. He said that it means that when. Homosexual. In both men and the both men and women. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, he said that it's both and according to the spirit of God, how we do it. He said both men and by sex. Yeah, but when Pastor was praying, he said, Stop. So, you know, there is some seeds. Sometimes you trigger the spirit of God. You think that, oh yes, I know everybody sins. They will deceive me. Sometimes we give excuse. They will deceive us. They will deceive us. But sometimes there is things you will see in the spirit of the anger of God will be upon you. Praise the Lord. So we have to be very careful. For God to see this woman, the woman is, is he has, she has an angelic voice. And she came for personal prayer and the spirit of God said, stop, pastor, stop. So for you to see the anger of God, praise the Lord. So we have to be careful in whatever we are doing you know that god he, they are god we have i know god is a merciful god sometimes we say god grace is there heart. he sees everything praise the lord amen okay thanks for sharing that okay where were we um yeah i did ask the question what excuses have you heard people say you'll have one more to excuse me what oh excuse? i was drunk i was drunk <laughs> So we can use yeah, the I was personal economic conditions. That's another good one. I, yeah. well, I didn't have the money, I didn't yeah. have the finances, yeah. so I had to sin. So that would be like they had to see, they had to fraud, they had to do yes. something to get that money. All kinds of excuses. And some say everybody does it. And yeah. I say that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> that's, another, that's a biggie. Oh, everyone's doing it, so I'm yeah. the same. That's a big, but we're deceiving ourselves. Yeah. When we have these excuses, the Bible says we're deceiving ourselves. So, thanks, thanks for that input. So we're going to go verse 8 to 9. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he may destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. If we continue to live in habitual sin, John says we are of the devil, and Jesus came to destroy the devil. So this is a ritual sin is where you know you're doing it and you just don't mind, you have no conviction. I mean, people might sin and sin again until they, they might get conviction and then go back into it. That, that happens. But when you're doing it, knowing it, and thinking, okay, God is all right with this, I can continue. That's what we mean by ritual sin. I've heard it a lot of times, oh, God's got me. God's got me. They'll make an excuse, God's got me. Yeah. That's a lame, lame. Mm. If God had you, He would be wanting to sin. Yes. Yeah? For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that He may destroy the works of the devil. John gave us a reason why Jesus came. In John 1 5, 3 35, 3 5, I'll read it. He was manifested to take away sin. So in John, 1 John 3 5, so we're here. And you know that He was manifested to take away our sin. And in him there is no sin. Now John gives us another reason that he might destroy the works of the devil in that same scripture. God is grieving over the way man has allowed the devil to wreak havoc in our world and in our lives. Jesus came to stop all of that by his life, his death, his suffering, and his resurrection. So when when God sees this, what sin is doing to mankind, 
He's actually breathing. And people always say, I've heard loads of people say, oh, why can't God stop this? Why can't God stop that? Because God gave the power to us. He gave the earth to us to rule and reign and have dominion over. And because we're not doing that, the enemy is gone. The enemy's got the power and the dominion. But as we rise up, as, as what's happening, I mean, it's not all, the, Christ, the church is, was asleep, but they're waking up. As the church wakes up and prays and, be, and, and act like Jesus, you're gonna, you'll see a change. You'll see the, a change in the life of the believers and you'll see a change in the things that we're praying for. Like we're praying now for the peace of Jerusalem. Maybe we won't see the peace come straight away, but it will be changing the hearts of the people there. Yeah. Because just as well as God wants to save the Jews, he wants to save the Palestinians. Absolutely. Who knows what's happening in the hearts of the Palestinians? Because a lot of them are innocent. Mm. They're, they're what we call innocent casualties of war. Mm. Just like our government. If our government decided that they're going to go to war, mm. or they're going to attack another country, and that country retaliates, then we innocent. will be mm -hmm. the innocents of war. So this is where the people don't look at the argument properly either on one side or the other. And it's almost as if now, if you don't believe what, what um, Amnesty was right, you're, you're going to be a target. What's, what's wrong, you're going to be a target. Yeah. If you believe that. But all wars are wrong in God's eyes. But people make decisions. Governments make decisions. It's not the innocent Palestinian people that are making that decision to go and attack Israel. Mm. It's not them. Yeah. It's, the, it's, the, it's the government. Believers, mm. so they're innocent on both sides. Innocent casualties of war, and we just got to pray for peace on both, 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 both sides. It's, it's very sad. So God is grieving over what's been allowed and how we've learned, because anything that's that severe is can't be of God. It's got to mm. be of the devil. Anything that kills, steal, and destroy is is not of God. So. On to. Many people are unnecessarily afraid of the devil. That's another thing. Fearing that you could, what you could do against them. If they only knew that as we walk in Jesus, the devil is afraid of us. This is what we've got to realize. The devil is actually afraid of us. And he's so afraid of us getting to know who we are in Christ. In Christ. And the power we have against him. Absolutely. That he will bring fear. And if we allow that fear to take over, we'll be cowering. And we won't get what... God's after us. We won't have that power to mm. defeat him. So that's why God says in 365 times in the Bible, once for every day of the year, mm. do not fear. Do not fear. That's a, it says that 365 days. Mm. 365 times. Nice. 365 days. So every day, get up and say, I will not fear. Because Jesus fear. lives in me. Whatever the enemy is bringing at me, <coughs> I will not have no fear. I will stand up and say, get thee behind me, Satan. How we have, we have to live Amen. because many, many fears will come every day. As soon as we get up, there's something. But if we get up knowing that as we get up, the devil's running away from us because he don't want to face us because we're strong mm. and we have no fear, then we will walk in victory, we will walk in power. It's, it's not easy and it's hard to get your head around because fear has just overtaken the world. But we should not fear. Jesus has utterly destroyed all the works of the devil, so we can too. Because we're in him, we're his seed, we are children of God. Just like Jesus was God's son, we are God's children. Mm. And Jesus did all those things, so we can too. Verse 9, whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him. So the seed, if you're reborn of God, the seed of God is in you, so you do not have to sin. When we are born of God, we no longer have the sin nature of Adam in our spirit. So you've got when we're born, we born again, we've got a new spirit. Because if we're not born again, we've got that sin nature of Adam. Remember Adam and Eve? We, we know that story. That they choose chose the wrong thing, they sinned, and they were like separated from God. Mm -hmm. But when we're born again, we become children of God. And we receive the overcoming and obedient nature of Jesus. Even though we don't sometimes we don't realise it, what's inside of us the spirit inside of us is overcoming the overcoming and obedient nature of Jesus. We can be obedient against sin. We can overcome sin because it's in us. 
been dormant, and a lot of times it's dormant in us because we don't know. So that's why Paul says, stir up the spirit that's inside of you, so you can edify yourself. You're not weak, you're strong, and you must stir up the spirit inside of you, and you must be baptized with the Holy Spirit in order to do that, so that you can walk in victory. It's the same message Paul preached, saying to the believers in Ephesians 4, 22 and 24. By the way, sin weakens that. that if, if, if sin weakens the Spirit of God inside of us, Absolutely. it really does. And that's why God doesn't want us to sin. Mm. It says, put off concerning your former conduct. So, you know, when we were in the world, we were sin. We didn't conducted ourselves differently to when we're born again. Yeah. That's what he's trying to say. We should be putting off that form and way of life, how we used to live. The old man, which grows corrupt according to deceitful lust. We talked about lust last week. Lust of the flesh, lust of the spirit, and the pride of life. Right. This is what Paul's talking about. And that we are put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So the new spirit that's inside of you is created in righteousness and holiness. So we've got it. We've got it. It's just that we need to use it and put off the old man who's trying to um, squash that spirit. We have to put it off. We have to do it by our own. Because we've got free will, we've got to decide that's what we want to do. Verses 10 to 15. Okay. As believers, okay, in this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the wicked one, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brother's was righteous. Do not marvel, my brethren, if we, the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother, brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. So, as believers, we shouldn't deny the existence of the devil. We shouldn't. We know it because it's biblical. But we shouldn't be obsessed with it. The reality of the devil is a biblical fact. So, it's the truth. We cannot, we cannot be born again without having love and righteousness. Both of these are essential. So we must have the, the, the right, we must have the righteousness, which is the right standing with God, and the love of God. They're essential for the Christian life. Righteousness without love makes one a religious Pharisee. What were the Pharisees like in the old in the Old Testament? And even in the New Testament, what were they like? They knew the word, but they had no love. They just used to be the they were like the leaders that had no love. They were the ones who actually um, persecuted Jesus. The Pharisees were the ones that persecuted Paul. Pharisees and the Sadducees. They knew the Bible really well. They knew the word really well, but they didn't have the love. So they, they were just religious Pharisees. They were just they just knew religion. It was just all about religion. It wasn't about the love of God. And love and love without righteousness makes one a part of the devil. So we can say, if, um, for instance, the world would say people in the world would say, oh, we love each other. I love my wife, I love, yeah, I, I believe that. But it says love without righteousness, you're one partnering with the devil, with evil. So you have to have both to be a child of God. Jesus was completely righteous and completely loving, and we can be too. If we know and believe that we are the children of God, we've just got to believe who we are. Verse 12 says, it says that Cain murders his brother Abel because his works were righteous and Cain's works was evil. Cain was disobedient to God and tried to hide his sin. So this is why God is saying if we confess our sins, um, we can have forgiveness. So Cain was disobedient to God and tried to hide his sin. Cain refused a warning from God about his sin of hatred. So the sin of Cain at that time, he hated his brother. He had hatred in his heart. This made him miserable and envious of his brother Abel because Abel was righteous to so it's like Cain hated God, but Abel loved God. So Abel brought a better sacrifice than Cain. So Cain started to get jealous of that love that Abel had for God. And this, um, it's, that's what caused him to murder. Because even though we're saying, that the Bible says, hatred is 
as the crime of murder. So if you hate your brother, you, you actually want to murder him. I mean, none of us would admit that, but um, if we hate something, we actually don't want it around anymore, <laughs> to be honest, if we really think of it. How many times have we thought, oh, I hate that person? And don't, don't you feel like, oh, I wish they were dead? We have to be honest. That's what hate, that's what hate caused. We wish that person wasn't around anymore. I mean, it might just be a ple pleasing thought, but if we keep on with that hatred, then we, this is our lot of murderers, um, plot murder, they actually hate something, they go away, they plot the murder, and they carry it out. But it begins with hating. You would not murder something that you love. You would not kill something that you love, be it humans or animals. You wouldn't kill something that you love. So that's where hatred, that's what hate leads to. And where it says, do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. So he says, we should not be surprised when the world hates us, but we should be surprised if there is hatred among, among the believers. There should not be any hatred among the believers, the brothers and sisters. If we hate someone, we may not carry out murder physically, but we wish them dead in our hearts. And that's the bottom line. So, verse 16. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So he's just he's just alliterating all that Jesus has done to, done for us. We should be doing the same for for each other, as brothers and sisters. We ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters by having concern for their welfare and sharing what we have with them. Because it also says here, if you have something that you can share with your brother and you don't share it, it means you don't love them. If you have more than your brother and you see that they're in need and you don't do something about it, it means you don't love them. So it's, it's, it's something that we don't think about, but because it's in the Bible, we really have to think about it. We have to think about it. If we hate someone, we make, oh no, I said that. Let us not love in words alone, but in our actions towards each other. Verse 20. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our hearts and knows all things. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence in God. So here Paul is saying, if our hearts assure us, we should see this love at work in our lives. We can know that we are of the truth. And, the, and this brings assurance of our hearts before God that we are standing in him. So if we have... Um, we need assurance in our heart that we're standing right before him, but if we don't have that, um, if we feel condemned in our hearts of, all the time, it shouldn't be, we shouldn't be feeling condemned all the time. That's not of God. This is not of God, it's of the devil, who is the accuser of the brethren. That's because we're allowing the enemy to accuse us. We shouldn't feel condemned all the time. We must trust the word of God and be assured that we are, right stand, we are in right standing with God and not how we are feeling. Because sometimes our feelings betray us. And if we go into condemnation, we may, may, may get depressed and say, oh, we'll never be good enough for God. There's no such thing. Mm. We are good enough for God. He doesn't Absolutely. put any standard like that on us. Mm. All he's asking us to do is walk in righteousness, ask Jesus to help us. He sent Jesus, he sent the Holy Spirit to help us. That's all he wants of us. Mm. But he would never condemn us for nothing. But we should, we should, as Christians, be wanting to please him. Be wanting to walk in righteousness. Mm. That's something as a Christian we should want. Even though we haven't got it straight away, we should be wanting it. So it says, um, we must trust the word of God and be assured that we are in right standing with God and not that we are not with our feelings. Condemnation does not come from God. So no one should leave here condemned by anything. Mm. But know that who we, who we are, that we are children of God and we have an advocate with the Father. To verse 18 now. My little children, let us not love in words or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our hearts and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence towards God. So if we haven't got condemnation in our, our heart, it's because we're confident of who we are with God. Mm. And what we ask, we receive from him. 
So if you come to that stage, whatever we ask of God, we will receive. That's the stage where you get to where you can just pray and God will give you what you ask for. Especially if it's good, if it's good for us at that time. It might not come straight away, but if it's good for us, God will give us all the good things. Mm. Um, it says, His commandments and does not these things are pleasing in His sight. Because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. So once we keep His commandments and do pleasing things, it's so easy for our praise to be answered. Otherwise, sin actually blocks our praise. And this is His commandment, that we should believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. Now we're going back to that again. Mm. All inches on that. Believe it on the Lord Jesus Christ and have love for the brethren, for one another. As he gave us the commandment. Wait up. That was okay. Amen. <laughs> Didn't put too many questions in, so we were able to get through it. Okay. Hallelujah. Thank you, Sister Sonia. Question? Anyone? Pastor, do you have one? Question. Uh, yes. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yeah. The next one is going to be worship. As they are getting ready, let's look back and forth and see if we have one or two questions to put to her. Yeah. She's here to help us. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Where it touched me, where it says, for this reason Christ was manifested. That's a very deep one. Mm -hmm. But we have to know actually why Christ came. He came for a purpose. Not just come, mm. he came to destroy the works of who? Of the devil. Praise the Lord. Amen. So when we say the devil ready to do it, oh, it's the devil. But Christ actually came to do what? To destroy. To destroy. To destroy. So how are we still blaming the devil? If everything the devil is <laughs> doing it for our Father, it's here for one purpose, just to destroy all of it. All the works of the devil, praise the Lord. Amen. We are free indeed. Amen. The devil does not have any hope. It has nothing. We don't have to blame the devil. Rather, we have to claim. We have to know who we are. We are children of God. Amen. We are completely made. No one has any powers to bring us down. Why? Because our Father came to destroy. Destroy the works of the devil. To destroy the power of the devil. That's why we can stand and say, Father, we love you. That's why he's telling us, go out there and lead. It's the life that Christ led. If your brother is in need, do not close your heart. If you do that, how dare you to say that you love God and that the love of God is in you? It does not. So praise the Lord. Shall we please rise? Put our hands together to our Lord Jesus Christ as we welcome the worship team. Oh, Jesus, you are. 
Those that have not given, oh God, you're going to bless, you're going to open where, you're going to prosper us, Lord, because for our prosperity belonging to God, you teach us how to prosper. I bless your name, Lord Jesus, and I pray that every one of us will receive, oh God, even those that have given, oh God, through bank transfer, through online, oh God, but I even through PayPal, oh God, and Father, through direct debit, but I see it all. Bless it. Bless every one of us, Lord Jesus. In hundred folds, we pray. Amen. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Give Jesus a clap offering. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Indeed, our God is worthy. Praise the Lord. Amen. He is worthy indeed. Announcement. Tuesdays from 1 to 2 p.m. Our pastor will be on YouTube. Ministry will be good news. Our intercessor survival prayer session will be held at the prayer house at 3 o'clock to 4 p.m. on Tuesdays. Our house fellowship is held at Sister Eldefina's house, 6.30 to 8 p.m. on Wednesdays. Thursdays, 1 to 2 p.m. is YouTube, followed by the healing ministry, which is held at Sister Sonia's house. The time is 7 to 8 p.m. 30 p.m. Breakthrough video is held at the prayer house Fridays from 11 p.m. to 1.30 a.m. Prayer Warriors session is held at the prayer house on Saturday 1.30 to 2.30 p.m. followed by the street evangelism. We are advised to assemble at the prayer house and depart to different locations as directed, but the time is 3 to 5 p.m. And then on Sundays, from 10.30 in the morning, we are here to worship our God. Shall we please rise and put our hands